All righty, greetings, 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 everybody. We're going to get started. You there, Rashad? Sweet. Greetings, Emma, in the chat. I'm going to pass it to Rashad. What's up, everybody? My name is Rashad, and I am a member of the AAPRP uh, Southwest chapter, <clears throat> and we are a, a revolutionary pan African socialist organization. Uh, where our goal and objective is Pan-Africanism. And we, we understand that Pan-Africanism is one united socialist Africa. And yeah, that's what, we're, that's what we're working for. That's what we're building towards. And yeah. And so this week, uh, this month, you're joining us for our uh, Pan-African film series that we do on the second Saturday of every month. And um, it used to be an in-person event that my good folks, um, uh, in the uh, New Mexico area or the Tiwa territory area uh, used to do in person at a school. But since the pandemic and stuff like that, we've been doing it online and um, live on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook and all that such. And so, yeah, so yeah, um, this week we're uh, watching a little part of a lecture that um, our comrade Afiong L. Afiong L. Afiong did um, uh, titled Weapons for Liberation. and. Yeah, where she just goes into she goes into details. She talks about um, Obama and the Clintons and uh, the need for the diaspora to be unified. And yeah, and so yeah, so we'll do that. We'll watch that. It's pretty short. It's like thirty eight minutes. Um, and so after that, we'll get together and we'll discuss and you know go over some things that um, go down in the chat and everything. And yeah, so we'll get all that done. By the way, I'm out. My bad, my bad. But by, by the way, I'm out here from uh, Occupied Ute Territory, Denver, Colorado. So yeah, good to see everybody. Thanks Rashad for that great intro. Also Oyasano, Occupied Tiwa Territory. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and display the video and we'll get started. If you have any issues hearing or seeing the video, please let us know in the chat and we'll try to address. Uh, otherwise, we will see you after the program. Going forward, um, you know, I used to hear about the Matrix, you know. I'm not a movie person. <laughs> I like the theater, mm -hmm. but not necessarily movies, just because I'm, um, yeah, I'm not necessarily in one place, you know. I don't sit down for a long time. So if I'm traveling, obviously you're, you're forced to sit down, you know, six, yeah, seven yeah, hours yeah, on the plane, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm caged in, so I watch stuff when I'm traveling. So I watched The Matrix for the first time. I really watched it. I thought, wow. It's really true. You know, have, who hasn't watched The Matrix? Okay, well, it, it's important to try and watch it. It's amazing. You know, so that's really good. So, But that's how we're living now. We're in The Matrix. It's a life of make-believe, you know. But it's real. <laughs> you know, they've made us. We are The Matrix, you know. It's illusion, it's magic. You know, you watch The Magician. I just watched the other one the other day. It just coughed out a, a, a toad <laughs> a frog from, you know. I don't know how that works out, but he did. Okay? Okay. So, so that's that. Um, so, but I'm saying that we must watch The Matrix. The other thing about, you know, when they say um, art, is it art copies life? What is it that they say about art and life? Life, life. life imitates art and... Yeah. This is serious. You have to watch their films to know what they're yeah. thinking. Yeah. Mm. You know? okay. Don't take their films at face value. Yes. How many of us have watched Avatar? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, when I saw it, I was like, you know, I had to watch it about two times, two or three times. And so, and I'm watching and I watch them studying. I study them. I watch them intently and I watch it one time and I watch it again because I would have missed something. And, you have to take this thing seriously. Avatar tells you how they operate. First, they identify the resource. Then they come and ask nicely. Okay? As they're asking nicely, they're bringing in the troops. They have the scientists, they have the missionaries, then they have the army. You choose which step, whether it be A, B, C, C, D, A, or B, D, A. But they'll ask nicely first. 
And when I watched, I thought, oh my God. But you see now, they are so bold and strong and they have the impunity to show you the things on film. Okay? While black people are still doing films about love, mm, kiss, kiss. <laughs> yeah. Mother-in-law is a witch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody did some juju for me. To those, are the kind of things. those are the films we are still doing. These people are doing films about Matrix and Avatar and space. Oh, God. I wish I could have a transmission. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Michael Jackson and I, we're, we're, we had the same agenda, you know? If I had money to change, honestly, I'll run away from all of you. I just get so fed up. Oh, God. You know? So one, on, on one trip, you're watching Avatar. On the other trip, you're waiting for the weekend mother in law. You know what? I said, what kind of life is this? Do we live on the same planet? Anyway, let's leave that. Mm. Um, you know, I questions, you know, I discuss with my comrades, you know, and keeps me awake at night, I wake up in the morning, you know, it's worrying my mind. Because in struggle, there's so much to do and there's so much work to do. So then the question I've asked myself, what is the one thing, if, if I could focus on one thing, what is it I can focus on? Because it's very overwhelming, especially when you go back home. When you go back home, and from there you look at the West here, it's like we're joking. Even the hard work that we're doing now is just um, like a child. You see, like, child yes, child play. It's, it's just like that child, you know. Her whole life is just her mother's breast. That's her whole <laughs> life now. That's how I, where her life revolves around. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's where we still are. I'm saying we are faced with such things of tremendous, mm. you know, um, volume that you can't even, especially when on the continent, you know, how terrible things are. And it's this same imperialism that has stretched its arm mm. that far. You know, here, you know, we're inside the belly of the beast. So it has its front yet, so it has its belly. But on the continent, we are in the backyard of the beast, where the poo, -poo comes out. And if we had any sense, we would align with ourselves. So we're able to attack the beast in its belly or its throat or, or even stab it so bad in the backside that it affects it. It, 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 it gives a mortal wound. You know, this is how we need to be thinking, how we need to be planning, but instead, those who are in the belly of the beast, you know, are very comfortable. That's right. So, you know, when it's eating and, you know, the little, the, the other things that don't get digested, you know, those of you in the belly, you eat that bit. And we're very happy, mm. you know, to have that bit. Of course, you know that by the time the food comes down to the end where we are, you know, at the back, it's nasty. So that's why we, who are in the backyard of the bum of the beast, we aspire to come into the belly of the beast. Yeah. Where we can get some of the oh remains from the guts. Oh Instead of thinking of how to locate the underbelly of the beast and kill it. That's yes. right. Word, word, word. Word, word, word. So I'm saying all these things to say, and you know, I don't just talk for talking sake. Mm. Everybody must try to say, where am I in the picture of African liberation? Mm. This is the question every individual must ask themselves what is my role where am i located in this picture for example what is my mission in this struggle for african liberation because each and every one of us we have a mission we have a reason for being we have work to do each and every one of us don't think anybody has more skills or is better, is more articulate or is cleverer than the other. It's not true. Mm -hmm. The skills you have could even be 10 times more advanced than what somebody like me has. Mm -hmm. Never underestimate the strength and the power within. And the other thing about power, sometimes when we talk about power, 
we conceptualize power as something, for example, that is located in 10 Clowning Street, <laughs> you know, or, you know, uh, yeah. at the, you know, Cream House in Washington, D.C. We think that power is external, but, you know, I'm coming to understand that power is actually internal. You must gain power over yourself first. Power over yourself. So when we start little things, like returning their names to them. Returning their hair to them. Returning their clothes to them. Returning their food, you know, lots of things, beginning to return their things to them. And as you return their own to them, you pick up your own. That's exercising power over yourself. First, before we begin to organize for it amongst ourselves. Because if we don't do that, just at the moment when we're about to strike, somebody will say, no, this nice man looks like Jesus. I can't attack him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one resembles the other ones from the East. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they're my brothers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's so important, the self. You must conquer self. And with the question of power comes the question of discipline. Right. If you don't have self-discipline, you have nothing. Right. Yes. Discipline, power. So I was saying that, you know, I asked myself, what can I do? What, what is the one thing I can concentrate on? Because it's overwhelming. Mm. And I realized something. That because the vast majority of us are still fast asleep, if you could even concentrate on the question of waking up our people globally, on the question of conscientizing the African, mm -hmm. on the question of, of attempting to reach that irritated genie that is buried deep within each and every one of us. Yeah. If I could just even take that task and begin to implement it, we might be getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. Because the day we wake up and just push the master's table mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. It's finished. Yeah. It's yeah. Game is done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Game is done. Yeah. So I'm saying, so for me now, standing in front and speaking, I'm working. Mm -hmm. I'm not having a chat or right. discussion. Word, I'm word. at work. Word, 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 word. I'm at work. Yeah. I'm not socializing. Yeah. It's not the social location. I don't come to socialize. I'm not having a chat or just a discussion and some tea. I'm busy at work. Right. Right. Because knowledge and information, you know, it must be that we we use it like a butcher's knife. We're sharpening our knives. That's right. And why would a butcher have a knife if he isn't going to use it? That's right. <laughs> it must be a weapon. Yes, for struggle, mm -hmm. for freedom, for liberation. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that, you know, that same thing applies to us. Mm -hmm. That whatever we do, whatever our skills or our profession, you know, is, whatever it is, adding different things. Some people are in front, some are behind, you know, some you don't know, whatever. It must be a weapon mm -hmm. for our freedom. Word, word, sound, That's word, the point word, 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 sound. So, in terms of going forward, we have to start to attempt mass reconscientization of right. our people. That's right. Mass reconscientization. Mm -hmm. If we woken up, if we say we are awake, you better make sure you wake ten more people up. That's right. Unless you will die. That's, That's right. right. That's Nobody's right. escaping alone. You can think you're as clever as wherever you're wasting your time. We'll either sink mm -hmm. or we will swim mm -hmm. together. That's right. So it's in our own interest yes, right. to wake as many people as possible up. Right. And in waking people up, we then begin to organize. That's right. To organize. So when we talk about organization, it's not some 
flimsy thing we're just saying and just yeah yeah they're just trying to recruit you <laughs> he said do or die affair and so if we like you can wait till the 11th hour at a point in time when things become critical let's say we've been saying that everybody on this street coming to number 282 you know we're going to board the door you know there's there's something coming down the road and we need to get in here you know to hide because there's a bunker under this place so i'm taking my time i don't believe it if we know that by 12 midnight they'll strike yeah. and we've been telling you six days ago five days ago <laughs> let me tell you something you turn up here at 11 p.m i have your won't let you in <laughs> do you understand what i'm saying yeah. after a while it will become too late mm. that after a while we will then need to see you as the enemy because if you're not part of the solution, you must be part of the problem. That's right. Right. Because in wanting us to open the door at 11 p.m., mm -hmm. you are opening us up to the enemy rushing in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just using these simple analogies mm -hmm. for us to understand that everybody has a stake, a responsibility, and a duty in this struggle. So I'm saying that, you know, I thought, you know, I, I think that the question of, you know, conscientization mm -hmm. is a key part of the work, but that must be taken to the next level. I was listening to, you know, a discussion about black history, and you know, we, we say all the time, oh, they don't teach African history in the schools, you know, and this, and we, <laughs> we, you know, we cry about that all the time. But do you know why they don't teach African history in the schools? And they don't even teach African history in the schools on the continent. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? Yeah. They can't afford to do it. Exactly. They can't. Because if they did it, there'd be revolution tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So you must understand yeah. the limitations of the enemy. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. if that is a limitation for him, that's, right. that's an opportunity yeah. for us. Yeah. 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 They don't not teach it because they don't want to and they don't want to educate you like a lot of us think. No. They can't afford to tell you who they really are. They can't afford to tell you what they really did. Can't afford to tell you what they're still doing. So that's our work. To teach her from day one. So she grows up. You know, with this in her mind. I was watching something just yesterday on YouTube and, you know, one white man called into a program, you know, this is America, you know, and this is our land. And the, the Native American went to that one. It's yeah. not America, it's his Polynesia. Yeah. I had never heard that being said like that yeah. before. Mm -hmm. And she taught her history in about two minutes. Yeah. So this is not America, yeah. this is Polynesia. Yeah. So you go back to where you came from. She quickly, you know, dropped the phone. <laughs> Imagine if everybody had that kind of confidence and knowledge instead of being defensive to, you know, include us in America. I said, no, no, this is not America. You go back to Europe. So black history is important, but sometimes also some of us get caught up in Egypt. And we go back into Egypt and we just want to stay there because the pyramids are very, they're warm and they're comfortable you know, and they're massive. They can accommodate all of us. So we want to stay there. There's a war being fought today. Use the knowledge of Egypt as part of our armory. But don't go and hide inside the pyramids. <laughs> Thinking that if you stay there for 3,000 years, you know, by the time you come out, the war would have finished. <laughs> Imperialism will still be waiting for you. Because some of us are like that. Yeah, black history, black history. I was in a meeting the other day, somebody was talking about spirituality. Say, yeah, you know, we use spirituality as a weapon. I said, that's true. So I said, help me out. See, so, yeah, we chant them down. <laughs> I said, are you serious? I think you're serious. He said, yeah, we do that all the time. I don't want to name the order. You know, we chant them down. <sighs> I feel so tired when I hear things like this. <laughs> so explain that spirituality is not a cr crutch. 
in Haiti, they use it as yes. a means of mobilization of yes. driving of the spirit yes. of our people to move into battle. Yes. Yes, Even sir. if you read their Bible, every time before a war, they bring out the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> they use it as a prelude to war. Yeah. Yeah. They want to use it and chant. I mean, we're jokers, you know. 2016, <laughs> you want to chant down imperialism. <laughs> so you see that we live in um, in a world of illusions. Yeah. There's a fight going on here. Somebody was also challenging us. Do you believe in African traditional religion? I'm talking of something. It's question whether I believe in African traditional religion. So I said, what's the point? He said, because you can use it. To, I just, you know, I get so tired. You know? But let me leave that. <laughs> um, what does black power look like? That's a deep question. Mm. When Africa, when there's black power, Africa is able to rule herself. Mm. That's the most important thing. The question of sovereignty mm. over our own homeland. Yeah. Mm. One of the definitions of power is the ability to define reality. That's one of the most basic definitions of power. Right now, imperialism has power. If they decide that by, by next week, Tuesday, there'll be you know a nuclear bomb or whatever, that's exactly what will happen. If they decide that um, next month, we won't call it December anymore, we'll call it December, that's exactly what will happen. Yeah, exactly. They have the power. Right. To define reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they decide that yeah. the train stations, you know, you go to the train station and in order to get through, you, you know, hit your head three times on the barrier, <laughs> that's ex you're laughing, it's true. <laughs> that's exactly what will happen. Yeah. Yeah. That is power. Mm -hmm. The ability to determine mm -hmm. reality. That's right. So, the day that we have power, because black people think we are fighting against Eurocentrism, fighting against racism, that, you know, uh, white people must respect us. I don't give a damn about respect. Yeah. 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 I'm concerned with power. Not with respect, not with love. Not with acceptance, they must accept me. Who gives a damn? Equality. I want power. Power. Power, not fame. Yeah. Power. 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 So in terms of, you know, Africa now, if we have control over our resources, if you have control over the tap in your yard, you can turn it on and you can turn it off. But now the tap of our resources is on full flowing with a pipe that leads directly to the west the day you are able to turn that tap off and keep it off even for yourself because it hasn't the resources haven't been used you know you haven't known the resources anyway you won't be missing them close the tap Within two days, you will see blood flowing mm -hmm. like rivers on the streets mm -hmm. That's right. all over the West. Mm -hmm. Days. If you turn those taps mm -hmm. off, that would be power. Mm -hmm. Because not just about turning them off, you have to be able to guard them. That's right. To right. keep yeah. them oh. turned off. Yes. And wait and see hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. Then you see all these black people that said they're not Africans. You won't know. They won't even know that they have uh, witchcraft power to to run to Africa within a minute. I'm saying to literally just disappear from here and appear home. <laughs> That's what power looks like. That's what power would look like. Mm -hmm. And see the Chinese, they have power. If you mess with a Chinese person anywhere in the world, you know that you're not dealing with Chongqing. You're dealing with China. 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 Mm -hmm. And the population of China is about a billion. More than that. And yet, yes, sorry, more than that. Yes. Yes. 
and still they've kept themselves as one country. Why? They understand power. That's right. That when you face the Chinese, you face one China. China. One China. And that's why they fought. You know, they had a civil war. That's right. They locked the whole country down yeah. and fought to the death. Yeah. And it was those who survived, and they opened the country and said, we are China. China. Yeah, that's right. Work. That's what power looks like. Work. But look at us. 54 countries. 54 beggars. I'm proud of it. Oh, I'm proud of it. I'm ve oh, very proud of it. Some of us, you know, like Nigeria, we big and bad. Our own begging bowl is a gold one. <laughs> the others who don't have so much money, they have brass begging bowls, oh, silver not. begging bowls. We don't bother with them. Calabash. Yes, some of them even have calabash. Our begging bowl is big, it's gold, it's shiny. And we're very proud. India summons Africa. India! India. Summons Africa. And we go. China summons Africa. Obama summons Obama Africa. Summons Africa. <laughs> every Russian, everybody, and we go. In fact, the latest, the one in the, that they went to in India, sometime late last year, it got so bad that apart from them all assembling the heads of state, the Indians made them wear Indian clothes. <laughs> Haven't you seen it on Facebook? Someone said, I can send it to you. And they came out. <laughs> oh, black people. Oh. We are pathetic, pathetic people, because they're going to beg. All the resources that we have them, go and beg. So which, who was the artist? It's in the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. In the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. Rat race. That's the one. That's us. In the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. Yeah, yeah, work, work. Oh. Yeah. So, and the other thing that we've got to realize is that Africa is our homeland. We've actually got yeah. to understand work, that here. Because sometimes I hear some people that Spurans say things like, oh, and you see that a lot on um, social media. Those continentals, you know, they don't like us. Or they say we're not Africans. Mm. Imagine you you or any of the sisters, somebody comes to you and says, you're not a woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would you respond to them? <laughs> no, tell me, think about it. So you're not a woman. So you're crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> they have to have to be crazy on medication or something, <laughs> or being bipolar or both. <laughs> but then somebody comes up to you and tells you you're not an African. And you become offended. You must be crazy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You need to understand that. And so there must be that deep understanding. Because even people on the continent do not know our history. That's right. mm -hmm. They've kept the history away from us. That's the right. same way it's been kept away from Africans in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. So don't think it's people on the continent know all this history. And No. Mm -hmm. The enemy is the same. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. That's right. Works out. Um, you know, we're talking about some of the things that have happened, you know, um, you said to give some more specifics. You see, the thing about Libya, Libya was the higher, you know, had the highest quality of life on the continent, you know, and, you know, amenities, social services, you know, quality of life, living, because their oil was used for them. It wasn't like how in Nigeria, you know, the benefits of the oil are used, you know, for other societies. And Gaddafi obviously had a lot of plans, you know, he was going to change the currency. Same thing, uh, what's his name, Saddam wanted to do. You know that the world currency is in US dollars. Mm. That's what keeps, props up their economy as the foremost economy. So um, Saddam was going to change, not was going, he, he had just done it, you know, to change their reserves from dollars into euros. euros yeah. mm. Gaddafi was also going to do the same thing, but wanted to make it into the gold dinner, dinner. you know, that this yeah. would be the currency of the global economy. They don't mess. You touch their profits, you're going. And that's exactly what happened. Because it was going to cut out, you know, the monopoly mm -hmm. of the dollar. And they don't play. And also, you know, this question of African unity, African unity, any leader that pushes that position beyond rhetorics, they're coming. Because that's the one thing 
if we achieve African unity, the game is over. Yeah. And that's why for us as political activists, our first, the first work is to achieve African unity amongst the people. Yeah. Because a lot of times when we talk of African unity, it's still on the state level, yeah. on the question of governments and countries. Right. Our continent is ruled by neo-colonial criminals, yeah. the vast majority of them. Yeah. And so that kind of unity will not come from the top. Yeah. We've been talking about it. They will not do it. Because they need to have, you know, their own private spaces where they're able to exploit, you know, the individual economies. Mm -hmm. So that unity will have to come from below. Right. When we get to a position where the people are saying, we will unite, we're already united, not we will, you know what I'm saying? That's the level we need to get to. And that can only be done, you know, people to people networks. That then makes the government policies irrelevant because we're already forming these bonds. But for us to do that, even we ourselves must understand deep in our psyche, not just something we say and we don't feel, mm -hmm. to understand that we are African. And to study about the other side, because people just sometimes concentrate on their own side. You must learn about sisters and brothers on the other side of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. There's your twins all over. You go to, you meet somebody who looks so much like you, you know, you, you, you'll be spooked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Literally, you will be spooked. Yeah. 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 So I'm saying, th th these are some of the things that are our personal responsibility. So anyway, that's what Gaddafi tried to do. Somalia was a victory for us, you know, because a lot of times we don't recognize our victories in struggle. That's right. When the Somalis, you know, took down the Americans in that Black Hawk, you know, down, you yeah. know, incident, you know, they whooped them, yeah. like they'll say in America, they whooped them bad. Yeah. But right. look at Somalia, a small country. Mm -hmm. They've already destabilized it, and yet they were able to organize themselves, you know, to chase the Americans out of their country. Mm -hmm. If Somalia can do that, what about the rest of us? Mm -hmm. Yeah? yeah? Africom. Is, you know, people might know it's it's a military, you know, command. These are things. These questions. This is something that is a whole meeting all of its own. Yeah. Because to even study the history, the origin, the politics of it, they've infiltrated the whole continent now because of these weak leaders, yeah, yeah. you know, that we have. And so, if like there's an uprising today, say in I don't know, choose any country, say Ghana, the American jets don't. They don't need to fly in jets from the U.S. They are waiting, you know, either in a neighboring country or even right there. They will put down the rebellion immediately because they are already on our soil. And our new colonial our leaders are so, they're so weak and such criminals that, you know, they're just so, so short-sighted. You know, they see the little benefits they give them without seeing that, you know, you're compromising generations That's to come. Right. That's right. You know? But you see, you can only have, at, at the end of the day, and this is a painful thing to say, people deserve the kind of governments they get. Because people who do not wake up and who are not able to speak up, and on the continent, it's usually because of religion, ethnicism, you know, these things divide us and don't allow us to speak. Then that's why we continue to have the kind of leadership, you know, that we have. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, you know, uh, Africans in the diaspora here. You know, if like in America, the best you can do in leadership is Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, that's an indictment on the people. Yeah, yeah. As for here in the UK, I don't even know who you have. You know, I don't even want to call some names because they're probably my friends. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm saying it's an indictment because some of us just point fingers. So, so and so is bad, you know, he's a sellout. He's a sellout because you are not even, you know, around. You're still at home. In the central heating, <laughs> you haven't even come out. Say so somebody's a sellout. Nature abhors a vacuum. If you don't occupy stuff, <laughs> Mr. Sellout will. <laughs> um, Haiti. It is too long, you know, to even start to go into um, Haiti. But the Clintons, you know, use that as their business, you know, angle and their little empire. You know, and um, of course we know the history of Haiti and their glorious history, but the Clintons are just such criminals. That's a whole thing in themselves, yeah. you know, in self of their business dealings, you know, in Haiti, which caused somebody was even said something. They made an analysis which is really interesting. You know that if uh, an earthquake hits any other country, even Cuba, because they are more organized, 
they're able to prepare better for it. But the impact of colonialism on Haiti, and colonialism in the sense that it's still continuing, mm -hmm. yeah. makes it such a situation that any earthquake or any natural disaster, uh, disaster has a, a, a genocidal impact on places like Haiti. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to say is that that kind of earthquake in Haiti is a colonial earthquake. Mm -hmm. In the sense that it is due to the disorganization, the state of disorganization of the society mm -hmm. that makes it incapable mm -hmm. of organizing itself mm -hmm. to prepare, you know, for nature. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, who are the forces of this colonialism? Mm -hmm. And the Clintons are, you know, a key aspect, you know, of that. But, you know, it's important that we start to give narratives and analysis from an African, you know, centered Absolutely. point of view to begin to see the world from our African eyes, word. not word. from CNN or BBC, word. Word. and that we have the capacity word. to, you know, lay out that narrative. Mm. For example, on the continent, when we're speaking, we'll say things like, and we just say naturally, oh, our colonial masters. We refer to these criminals as our colonial masters. And, you know, I'm saying, no, 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 because that's two things. Here, every African believes that, yes, they are masters, or they were, even if you say where, they were our masters. I say, no, they're not our colonial masters. They were criminals who colonized us. Because that's the truth. Criminals who colonized us. So you can imagine if our narrative is that, by the time that all that, all she's hearing, is criminals who colonized us. Mm. By the time she's a teenager or something, if somebody says somebody's a colonial master, she'll say, who? You mean the criminals who colonized us? Right, so she right. begins to see them for what they are, wow. criminals, yeah. not masters. Word, yeah. word. It's so important. Yes. Or even the issue of slavery. We say, oh, you know, um, like I hear people in America, you know, we were, we were slaves. Yeah. Or they captured this, they used us as they you know, were slaves and a slave, slave, slave. 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 I said, yeah. no. no, there were no slaves. That's right. They Come captured on. free people word. and en then enslaved slave. them. Yes. Now, when you use the word enslaved, the first question that comes to somebody's mind is, Who enslaved Ooh. you? Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. enslaved you? Yeah. So you begin to then say, Okay, these are the criminals. Mm -hmm. Because if you talk, if you say somebody's a slave, if you're a slave, then you're just a slave. Do you see? There's nothing. You cannot be redeemed. But if you were enslaved, it means somebody did something to yeah. you. So language is important. The narrative is important. And that understanding inside of ourselves. The Chinese, you know, they're coming very nicely, just like in Avatar. You know, offering a lot of money, which Africans with their art, you know, typical short sightedness are uh, accepting because we think that's quick money. But yes, build lots of things. By the time, you know, she's an adult, she's already, her life is mortgaged already. But these things are happening because there's a political vacuum. And it's not enough for us to listen to this kind of discussions. We've got to take it to the next level. So that remains our eternal challenge mm. and eternal responsibility. Mm. Even, you know, whatever we are, artists, whatever, we've got to be artists like Fela, mm -hmm. yes. like yeah. Bob Marley. Yeah. Every single record of Fela yeah. is raising an agitation. Yeah. Yeah. It's discussing struggle, it's yeah. discussing our lives. Yeah. So it's music, you're entertained, but you're also empowered. That's right. And Fela's music empowers us and it scares to death. The oppressors That's right. in Nigeria, the government hates you know yeah. Fela's music playing yeah. <laughs> because it's always you know condemning them mm -hmm. and indicting them, yeah. right. but empowering us. Mm -hmm. So we need we need to reproduce artists yeah. that empower us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm saying that if as an artist, you know, if, if that's your skill as an artist, make sure you are a liberation artist. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Don't be a foolishness artist. Yeah. 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 Because we've got 90% of that now. Clowns. Artistic clowns. Or clowning artists. Whichever one. So, um, I don't know if I've answered, you know, everything. But, you know, it's just, it, it's a lot of work. But, like they say, the journey of a thousand miles 
begins with the first step. Begins with the first step. Mm -hmm. So the question, you know, to, when we're living here today is, what will be my own first step? Yes. If it's if it's a first step, it might not necessarily be. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't, build on whatever it is you're doing or you're involved in. Yes. But for you not to be involved anyway in our liberation, you're very much part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And we cannot afford that. You know? So and you know when you're pushing a stone, you might not push it to the final destination, but because you've pushed it from A to B, somebody else comes and pushes it from B to C. Somebody comes C to B. But if you never pushed it from A, the struggle is that much harder. Good evening. Tendamwari, thank you for watching this video. We do hope you found it edifying and purposeful. Please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at our website, alkebulan.org. Okay, we're back. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for sticking around through that incredible talk. I feel very hype now. <laughs> She's so clear. <laughs> but what did you think, Rashad? Yeah, she wrapped me up. Um, it's just she's so yeah, like you said, she's so clear and direct, and you know she weaves in the humor, and that's always like a good thing for me. And that's why to me she's super effective, and that's why to me what makes what made Kwame Ture super effective, even Malcolm X super effective, and you know like it's just that long lineage of of uh, you know that gift of being able to 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 be so clear and like broad but also super concise at the same exact time and so yeah she's she's cold that combination of like playfulness with like militancy i think is like a really african thing ajamu has a two ajamu umi in the aprp i feel like it's it's something that's like intrinsic to our culture i also feel like that's why so many of our like stand-up comedians like now we have a bunch of clowns a bunch of people who are like petty b pretending to be woke like dave Chappelle. but before we had folks like richard pryor for example um, who had like a really intentional political body of potentially political body of work, an intentionally like challenging body of work. Um, so I feel like, yeah, that combination of like, yeah, playfulness, militancy, clarity, being able to just like speak in regular language is something that I notice a lot of um, of our most powerful speakers have. So it's great. Um, but what are some things that stood out to you from her talk? To me, the power, the power aspect of it in one power to me is like um yeah that's probably like the most i mean she everything was great but that to me that was like the most like important part because i think it's like lost on a lot of people um i think well-intentioned people too also who like to focus on um you know anti-black racism and stuff like that and how pervasive it is uh, globally and you know that matters and stuff. We care about it, but at the same exact time, uh, that's not what the fuck actually you know like matters. We don't really like she said. We don't give a damn about like if you're racist. You know, <laughs> of course, like you know you feel it, but at the same time, bro, we want the fucking power. We want the ability, to, like she said, the ability to 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 define reality and to to have to be to, to have the ability to to define what happiness is for us and what health is for us and what. Um, wealth is for us we want that ability we don't care about if these motherfuckers is racist really like you know because once we have the power it doesn't matter it doesn't matter <laughs> so that's what we have to fight for and you know like i think a lot of people get stuck on on the anti-black on the anti-black racism and they don't realize that what we're fighting is the system that's <laughs> that we're fighting imperialism we're not fighting fucking racism bro we can do that after the revolution and shit like that, but yeah. I feel like after the revolution, we don't care because if we have a unified socialist Africa and the power that comes with that, if there's a bunch of racist ass Europeans, they will not have the power to act upon that racism. They will not have the power to make us have to deal with what's in their raggedy ass brains. So I feel like the focus 
And I feel like it's it's capitalism and imperialism that pushes this focus. The focus on like racism, the focus on what like Europeans think of us is like self-defeating because who cares? Who cares? Like uh, that 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 African lady with the sister locks, Katanji Brown Jackson was confirmed to the Supreme Court yesterday. And, you know, it's it's remarkable that, you know, how long past Obama we're still having this 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 the mass delusion that a person who looks like us, chosen by the enemy, ascending to a position of power within the enemy system, somehow represents like a, a material advancement in our struggle or a political advancement in our struggle. People are still stuck on, like I was talking to someone who was going hard, like hard trying to argue this was a win for us. I was like, it's Joe Biden's idea, dog. How is this? We didn't pick her. But anyway, so they were like, this shows like her she's she's really qualified for the job um she made it to the supreme court so this shows all the europeans who think they're better than us then they're not and i'm like who cares it's been hundreds of years like look at the civilization they built through genocide and slavery why are we trying to prove ourselves to them also what does that even do okay they understand an african can qualify for the supreme court which by the way already happened and then the man's white wife tried to overthrow the government with a bunch of rednecks, but that already happened. But like, so now they understand we can qualify for the Supreme Court and then what happens? And then what happens? Like, where's the power coming from that? So I really appreciated that when she was like, we don't care what you think of us. We don't care what's in your hearts and minds. We don't care about whether we qualify uh, for your criteria for leadership. We care about developing our own independent political power, our own control of our land and resources. We do not care what you think about us. That is very liberating logic. Yeah, 100%, because yeah, it's just um, like, and it goes back to like another part that she said in the video about like returning shit to them. You gotta fucking recognize that everything these motherfuckers built is trash. It's not, for one, they stole all of it anyway. Like, you know, they built all this bullshit through through theft and thievery and uh, conniving bullshit and, and fucking genocide and, and extreme violence. And they couldn't even do it right. Look at what the fuck they built. It just is whack. And so once we start internalizing that and recognizing that everything they fucking all aspects of this colonial imperialist society is whack fucking we can begin to move forward and and the 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 objectives and what we need to do and who we're actually fucking fighting will be a lot clearer because realize this is not our shit this isn't their shit i mean they built it but it's whack and yeah yeah we can overthrow it another uh one of my favorite lines in the whole video is when she's she's going basically for like cultural nationalism. She's saying there's like people among us, among African people who study African history, which is positive. Like we should know our history. We should know it starts before slavery. We should know it starts thousands of years before slavery. Um, however, there's a tendency to just do that, to just take an African name, to just start wearing African clothes, to immerse yourself in um, pre-colonial African history um, and African spirituality, and then not oppose or contend with the reality of imperialism at all. And the, what she says is like, don't go into the pyramids for a thousand years and think when you come out, imperialism is gonna be over. Imperialism will still be here. Imperialism will still be attacking Africa. And I feel like that was like such a clear and also funny, also really funny way of like uh, breaking down why a singular focus on African history without using that history as a weapon in struggles against imperialism today is just simply not enough. Like it's positive to study African history, but if that's all you do, you are simply not making a contribution. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's that's super important to remember because a lot of us do that. You know what I mean? And it, it's extremely important because you know I grew up fucking um, black history was a thing, and you know. I always want to learn more, but at the same time, we got fed with so much European shit and stuff like that. And, you know, so it's important to go back and to know your center and stuff like that and know where the fuck you come from and that it doesn't start. You're not a descendant of uh, slaves or slavery. You're a descendant of African people that come from the continent of Africa. So it's important to know that. But at the same time, when you get stuck in that, it leads to someone, uh, people in the chat are talking about the Kataji Brown 
Jackson and how she said at this at her little fucking confirmation that she was her ancestor's wildest dreams. And to me, that is exactly what the fuck happens when you get stuck in like in that and you know in in history and you don't use it to for liberation. You use it to fucking feel good and stuff like that. And that's just and that's it. That's where it ends. It's just oh yeah, I know black stuff and I know we were enslaved and I'm gonna use that to get me to be the Supreme Court. And so like, it's, it's ridiculous that she said that because that I know for a fact that's not our ancestors. That was nowhere near on the minds of our fucking ancestors at all. But at the same time, that's, that's to me, can that's part of the path that leads you to when you just get stuck on African history and stuff like that. And you don't use it as a weapon to fight back against the people who have been enslaving us and torturing us for the better path, the better part of half a millennium. You get, you get, people acting like fucking being a Supreme Court justice in the actual system that they created that's still torturing us is a win. And so, and you get her to say some bullshit that like fucking, all right, it's just nonsense, so yeah. Yeah, she was actually quoting that poem by Maya Angelou, Still I Rise. I feel like people need to let Maya Angelou rest. Like that entire class of people, just like leave her alone, please. Because Maya Angelou was in Ghana when Ghana gained its independence. She met Kwame Nkrumah. She worked beside Malcolm X and Nina Simone. Like this was a woman with pan-Africanist politics, with anti-colonial politics. And so to have her invoked in such a context feels so disrespectful to me. But also that poem is about uh, an Afri an enslaved African woman like rising up in defiance of the system that oppressed her, that enslaved her. And so to say, I'm joining the system. I'm like that woman in the poem. You didn't understand what Maya Angelou was trying to say, sis. You just didn't, <laughs> you just did it. So yeah, just the idea that we what we should aspire to is representation within their structures, that it doesn't actually matter the individual politics we have. We can align completely with like pilgrim law, with like Indian killer law, and like that's gonna be a win for us. It's just not, it's not realistic. And I feel like, again, it's a it's a, a objective that was not created organically from the African liberation movement, but which was imposed upon us systematically um, through a process of counter revolution. Like there's a reason why we believe that a black president or a black Supreme Court justice or what have you is some kind of uh, win for us, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. There's a reason why that belief persists. Uh, so yeah, it really appreciate the focus on this in this talk on like the necessity of building independent political power about how representation, um, uh, uh, visibility, uh, uh, individual advancement, none of those things represent any kind of advance for our liberation. It's very clear. Um, another thing I actually really liked was she puts like some geopolitical analysis throughout the speech. Like she's talking about what the Clintons have done in Haiti. She's talking about AFRICOM and its expansion under Obama. Um, and in Haiti in particular, she's talking about like the earthquakes and like the natural disasters that devastate the island on a regular basis, on a regular basis. But she refers to them as colonial earthquakes. Like, what do you think she meant by that? To me, what I think she meant by that, and like, well, what I'm pretty sure she meant by that is, I mean, I think we saw it I, I'm, I like hate that I don't remember when the last um, earthquake happened or was it a hurricane? It was last year. Oh my God. It just feels like, it felt like two years ago. Time is crazy. But yeah. So you, when, when that, when it happened last year, you saw people online talking about like, Oh, this is fucking God can't leave them. They can't catch a break. And it's like, no, we have to understand that. <laughs> you have to understand that and reframe it, like in the, what she was talking about in reframing it in um, the narrative. It's not that the fuck they can't catch a break, it's that they've their infrastructure has been literally destroyed through imperialism and these fucking greedy motherfuckers who will not let the fact that they beat them um, <laughs> in, the, in the early, in the 18th century, and they won't let that go. And so they keep their, their direct, ties to Haiti and how they impact that country is directly related to how they can't defend themselves against natural disasters and shit like that because they don't their whole infrastructure their 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 leaders have been cooed multiple times and so the devastation is caused by 
colonialism and imperialism. It's not, I mean, obviously natural disasters are, they're gonna happen, but to have the infrastructure to be able to absorb it and um, to be able to rebuild and stuff like that, it's not, they, they're not able to do it because of imperialism, not because they're just, oh fuck, they can't catch a break or, you know, they're just, it's just bad luck. No, 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 no. They've been deliberately set up to fail. Um, by the US, the UK, France and shit like that. So we have to understand it as that and not that like some fucking metaphysical nonsense. Yeah, people tend to like naturalize the consequences of imperialism, which I actually think imperialism also teaches us to do, to be like, yeah, Haiti's not being colonized. Haiti hasn't been intentionally and systematically underdeveloped for hundreds of years. Haiti's just cursed. I've heard African people say that. They're like, it's that voodoo shit. And I'm just like, whoa. First of all, that was like the part of the ideological foundation of their successful anti-colonial struggle. But second of all, you are ignoring the systematic looting and destruction of this country carried out by successive U.S. presidential administrations, carried out by the core group, carried out by the United Nations. They've been like straight up occupied. They've been looted. The Clintons literally treat Haiti like their personal plantation. Hillary Clinton helped pass a trade deal that depressed Haitian wages uh, 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 and then made union organizing illegal. So these are like, Haiti has been like messed with quite systematically. And it's like not at all part of the discourse about what is happening to that island. It is the pervasive anti-African racism that's causing people to blame Haiti for what is being done to it. And it's also uh, uh, like the way that imperialism teaches us to naturalize the consequences of colonialism to say that some people are just uncivilized. Some people just can't get it together. And that's why these white, European countries, these Western capitalist countries have to come in and save them. They'll make billions of dollars while they're doing the saving, but it just has to happen. It's for the best. Um, so her her pointing, like calling it colonial earthquakes is like a shorthand way of explaining precisely what you just broke down. And I feel like it's, again, like something that's really clear, really clear. And she talked later on in the video about the necessity of language, about um, um, how we can uh, reshape a narrative that is aligned with the principles of African liberation, in part by thinking about how we speak and think about how we describe things. And colonial earthquakes, I feel, is like a really, really clear example of that. Yeah, definitely. Cause, yeah, because like she said, you know, words, they're important and the way you frame things is like extremely important because they know they, uh, the imperialists and the you know the capitalists they understand how to how to twist things and say things without saying it or say it in a certain way that helps internalize things and helps um, frame things in a way that lead people down the wrong path and shit like that. So you know um, that's why you know that's another part you know the 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 recognizing that we aren't we weren't slaves and it's crazy that we still have to we like are literally in a, like a a little battle. You know, over here in America with just that. I mean, part of part of just that people want to identify themselves as descendants of slaves. And it's like it and but deny being African. It doesn't even really make sense. But but that's America forced this shit on us and shit like that. And so we're, we're dealing with it internally. But we see how destructive it can be to, to frame yourself as as that and not having like because then you get to completely eliminate who did it and shit like that and they just like get to escape and you get to integrate with them you forget that we were enslaved by a group of people that fucking made oh yeah they're probably you know they're dead now those group of people but their fucking descendants are still here and the the whole system is still here and so we have to realize that you know to, we have to frame ourselves in a way that under, that we understand who we are exactly and what the fuck was done to us by who. Yep, enslaved Africans. And those same po folks like like uh, Amer ADOS, American Descendants of Slaves, Foundational Black Americans, um, this 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 reactionary uh, political movement within Africans in the United Snakes that like condemns any connection with Africa, they'll say absolutely no unity with other African people, um, absolutely no association of us with Africa. We are Americans and we are slaves. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> why? 
why? <laughs> like, what is, why is that the identity you cling to? And if you know about like how Eidos came to be and their affiliation with white nationalist groups, it's very clear that it's controlled opposition. However, the fact that people are taking it up again shows like the importance, like the indoctrination, like the systematic colonial indoctrination that got our people to align with our literal slave masters, the people that are, as we speak, destroying Haiti, looting Africa, drone bombing African civilians. Like we got ourselves to identify with them and hate other African people. Like that is colonization, that's colonization. Um, but the other thing I was thinking of in terms of language and how we have to recognize it as like, not like a, it's not like a, 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 a key strategy. Well, no, how do I want to say this? Like changing language on its own is not, is not enough, <laughs> but it's important. So, um, cause uh, uh, I was thinking about the way that the enemy uses it. Um, and how often the way that we talk about imperialism is in language that was in itself defined by imperialists. Like I was thinking about the phrase regime change. It's coming up a lot. Uh, for example, Pakistan declined to follow the United Snakes in condemning Russia. And uh, as a result, for the past couple of weeks, they have been dealing with uh, a US-backed color revolution in that nation. And today, like about an hour ago, the progressive prime minister of Pakistan was deposed. So yeah, that happened within a few weeks. Um, and so people are talking about it. Anti-imperialists are the only ones that are. And I'm sure once like the Western media gets like the framing that they need, liberals will start talking about how he was authoritarian. But um, uh, even like anti-imperialists are being like U.S. regime change in Pakistan. And when you think, talk about like what regime change is, or you think about what regime change is, it's actually like usually an incredibly violent and systematically manipulative process. Like it calls for the backing of like far right uh, and fascist reactionary political movements in the targeted countries. It calls for the systematic repression of revolutionary and left and social justice political organizations. It calls for the destabilization of entire populations. Oftentimes it comes with economic sanctions that like starve and kill people. It can also come with military intervention, um, either in the form of like direct invasion by imperialist powers or by arming and backing those far right uh, and fascist forces like what's happening in Ukraine. So like when you what we call regime change is actually like it's like such a benign name for an incredibly violent process that happens over and over and over again. And like it came from them. It came from the imperialists. You know what I'm saying? Like so there's so many there's so many of their actions that we describe in like this weird benign way. But they're like incredibly violent. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Wait, 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 but real quick. He got the post today? Let's see. Let me confirm. Imran, what is it? Imran Khan? Wasn't that his name? Yes, you respond and I'll look it up. I'll find the exact details. Okay. But yeah, so um, yeah, because like that's how they that's how they do it. Regime change and they don't call it a coup or you know, um uh sanctions, and it's not like sanctions, they you know what we understand sections to be, but it's, it's war. That's, that's, that's fucking war blockades. That's war. That's warfare and shit like that. And so that's starvation. That's it. And so they know how to get away with playing with words and shit like that because, okay, sanctions. And that, well, I can't remember, I think it was Cat Williams and he was, uh, he was I think, it, um, I think it was on Pimp Chronicles where he was talking about um, how they did in, I think it was Afghanistan or Iraq. It can't even, either way, one of the, uh, one of the countries in the Middle East and how they would call the civilian casualties insurgents. And he was like, I don't even know no motherfucking insurgents. So I'm like, okay, you know, like, I guess they bad or something like that. So like, they know how to frame shit for Americans um, with their little propaganda tools by using words like that. And because they know, okay, well, sanctions. Oh, well, that just means that it's gonna, you know, it's gonna affect these two people or the prisoners and shit like that. We know it's an act of war and yeah regime change is a coup and it's an act of war and it's violent it, a lot of times violent and it's backing elements that we supposedly do not um, um support over here when we know that's a lie but yeah, absolutely um so i did find the latest on what happened in pakistan and he was in fact ousted from office uh so it says pakistan's prime minister imran khan has been deposed by a no confidence vote in parliament 
Days after he blocked a similar attempt, the passing of the motion on Saturday came after the country's Supreme Court ruled that the cricket star turned politician acted unconstitutionally in previously blocking the process and dissolving parliament. The no confidence motion, which required 172 votes in the 342 seat parliament to pass, was supported by 174 lawmakers. So that man is out. He is out. That's Anyways. bullshit. Because I thought he got, I thought he beat it, dude. Like, because they were, they've been doing this. I can't remember when it popped up. I think it was like two, three weeks ago. And, you know, I was like, oh, shit, they're going to get him. But then he came through for like two days, two, three days. And then they got him. That's fucked up. But that's the way they do it. And they act like, and they, they get to, and over here, we already hate the Middle East anyway. So it's like, oh, Pakistan, fuck them. They didn't even do nothing to us. They pro there's people here who think fucking Pakistan is one of the people who bombed us and shit. So like they don't even know. They're like, oh, Pakistan, fuck that guy. You know, he, they can say what they literally can paint whatever picture they want. It really wouldn't wouldn't matter. And you know, uh, there's only a small section of people who would like be like, fuck that. Liberals wouldn't care because all they had to do was call him authoritarian, and they're like, oh yeah, that guy's should have been gone. And so yeah, that's whack. Yep. And all of this started when the U.S. attempted to pressure Pakistan into tailing their attempts to isolate Russia. Pakistan under Imran Khan refused, refused to go along with it. He gave like a really powerful speech where he was like, we're not your puppets. We're not kids. You can't tell us what to do. That was a wrap. Clearly, the U.S. was like, well, fuck it. We're just going to get you out of there. And really, it's wild it's wild how the u.s and nato countries imperialist countries can just say we don't like that leader oh you chose them that's who you want we don't care we are going to destabilize your country we are going to back color revolutions we are going to get them out of there and put someone in there that will listen to us because that's what we want to do that's what they're trying to do to russia right now they're openly talking about assassinating Putin or overthrowing Putin or like sanctioning and making the Russian people so uh, suffer so much that they overthrow Putin. Like they talk about it out in the open and like the anti-imperialist left talks about it in like the most like, like so gingerly, <laughs> like they're like, they focus on like the internal contradictions of the targeted country. And they like, they like miss the forest for the trees, the trees being like, the, the, the sheer power of Western imperialism, how they can say, you are gonna go along with what we want. You're not even gonna be neutral. You're gonna go along with what we want or we're gonna get you out of there. And then they do it and there's nothing, like there's no consequences. It's bananas. So calling that regime change to me is very, yeah, it's, it's a it's a inadequate description of what's happening. Yeah. What other thoughts? Go ahead. Oh no, what were you about to say? What were you about to say? I was just gonna ask, like, what other thoughts came up for you from the video? Um, yeah, that made me mad. That's really, that's like unfortunate. Bullshit. Uh, it's bullshit. It's like they, <laughs> and that's okay. So this, this lead, this will lead me. This is a good little segue because another part that she was talking about was the fact that we have a duty, we have fucking work to do because what the fuck we're up against is so immense and powerful, and we're acting, we're playing games right now, and so it's like. Dude, I mean, it's important. We have to like get to work and we have to like actually start taking this shit serious. Like she said, we have to start taking it serious and realize that it's life or death. There is no fucking, there is nothing else. We can't, we're going to sink together or we're going to fucking swim together. So like, it's time to, it's, it's been, it's past time. Like uh, fucking George Jackson talked about it in blood in my eye. And like, it's, it's a, it was super galvanizing for me to read it. And he just was like, bro, we, there is no time. How many more people are going to die? How many more fucking presidents are going to be cooed? How many more nations are going to have their fucking democratically elected people, governments be toppled? How many more Libyas are we going to have? How many more Hades? Like how, how much longer? And so are we just going to keep kicking the fucking ball down the field until fucking we get 150 years later and our fucking great grandkids are still like, oh shit, like we're fucked. Or like, is the world like, so there is no time. And so we all have a duty to do and we can't pretend like, like, like freedom is being able to fucking travel to Miami every two weeks. That's not freedom. We're not playing games like and we need to stop that shit. And so, um, yeah, it's like, you know, that's, that's another thing that like stood out to me because we, 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 as much as all of us do, you know, 
as much as all of us do, or, you know, even we can all do more, no matter what it is, we can all do more and we have to do more and we have to get, like she said, grab 10 more people to fucking do more. And I'm not saying that's an easy feat, but we got to fucking, that's a task that we have. And so we got to do it. And um, yeah. Yeah. The, what she, the way she put it was like, if you are not actively engaged in the struggle for your people's liberation, you are working against that liberation. Like you're not on our side. And Kwame Ture says a similar thing. Secretary says a similar thing. And it sounds like, you know, this this society wants people to feel like any choice they make is is fine. Um, as long as it aligns with individualism and consumerism. Uh, but, you know, we have to recognize that we're a colonized people, that we are at war, that our enemy uh, is like putting on us, putting us on a trajectory of extinction, not just for African people, but for the entire human race. Um, and we're like, so many of us are going along for the ride, either because we think there's nothing we can do, or because we have been um, indoctrinated into this like kind of apathy. And so we have to have that mindset that you are either fighting for the liberation of your people, which means being active in a revolutionary political organization, making your contribution to our advancement as African people, or you are working against your people. Like that's it, we're at war. That's how it has to be. Um, and so I really, really appreciated that. But I also feel like the, the, one of the, the main points she's making in the video is that we are asleep. We are largely unconscious. And this is something that was, you know, a, a condition that was created intentionally. Like, you know, the U.S. has like one of the lowest literacy rates in the developed world. It's an extremely wealthy country um, where like about half the adults have below a sixth grade reading level. And that's not because they're stupid. It's because the, the, the public education system in this country has been systematically defunded and underdeveloped. Like this was intentional because the U.S. ruling class wants a submissive and confused populace. You can't teach people to read and teach them critical thinking skills and teach them real history and have a submissive and confused populace. So this is what we're dealing with and this is what has happened to our people. Um, and so the very first step, even before we get to the point where, we're, where we, we are actively engaged on a mass basis in this necessary liberation struggle is just to like wake people up on a basic level to get them to stop aligning with the enemy, to recognize who the enemy actually is and what it's gonna take to take them down. And right now, like that consciousness does not exist on a mass basis. It can be built. And she's talking about strategies for doing that, like the language that we use, um, studying African history, but using it. And also uh, she talks about um, uh, artists being revolutionary, which I wanna talk about in a second, but just like, but just understanding that the very, very first step the necessary first step that we need to take right now is like waking our people up, is like bringing them with us. We can't get any kind of action until that happens, but we will stay confused until we figure out how to do that on a mass basis. Yeah, and it's, you know, I like um, the, um, the whole woke thing has been co-opted and fucking twisted in a million different ways. So people who think they're fucking woke, it's like part of that African history thing or they're uh, focused on uh, is being Israelites or so such and so forth, and that's they're still asleep, but they genuinely believe that they're woke, and like that's um, that's because they don't recognize that we're at war with the people who like fucking built the fucking country that and are torturing us literally today. Like, and so um, we understand that it's intentional and shit like that, and that they did it, but like it's it's fucked up how well, it's just unfortunate how so many of us think we're woke, we're awake, and we're actually not. And I think that's like a big ass barrier because people, they'll think they're awake and won't even be able to listen to you or won't try and listen to you when you tell them no, like it doesn't stop just at representation. It doesn't stop just at getting Katanji Brown Jackson or it, it shouldn't even begin there, but it doesn't, that's not what we're focused on. We, we're at war with these people. They don't work. We're fighting for sovereignty. We're fighting for fucking the ability to control reality, our own reality. And so, um, yeah, it's, un you know, that's like, we have to wake people, but we also have to like, it's almost like we have to like double wake them up because it's good to get the African history and to start there, but now you got to fucking step, you got to jump to the next step. And we have to fight now. It's, we have to fight. It's not, we can't just read our way out of the fucking shit. We have to actually fight. And I'm not, that doesn't mean like guns and shit like that. I just mean we have to actually systematically organize ourselves to be able to strike blows wherever the fuck we are against the fucking imperialist system. Yeah. 
Yeah, and ideas are a weapon. Ideology is a weapon. Like folks in the APIP say that all the time. When we say fight, like there will be an armed phase because there's no way capitalism will go down without an armed revolution. However, this particular stage of the battle requires like what, like ideas as the weapon, ideology as the weapon, history as the weapon. So there's no excuse. <laughs> um, uh, also, a lot of what our people, a lot of confusion that exists among our people, it comes from the disinvestment in education uh, in capitalist and imperialist countries, but it also comes from mass media in capitalist imperialist countries. Um, uh, whether it's like the news, which literally straight up lies. I feel like people in the United Snakes do not understand that the people on the news, the 24 hour news, the six o'clock news, like the New York Times, Washington Post, they bald face lie constantly, like straight up to your face lie on a regular basis. Like every single issue of the paper, every single 30 minute segment of news, every single fucking every 15 minutes on CNN, they are just straight up lying. And a minimum an investigation would reveal it, but they know people aren't gonna do it because they systematically devalued education and people don't think critically. So they just straight up lie and people don't understand it. And the it's not just the news that's used as this tool of imperialist propaganda, it's also movies, television, music, like all pop culture in capitalist societies exists to push the values, ideologies, political positions of the ruling class that's oppressing and exploiting us, that's colonizing Africa. That's all it's for. So even media and culture that we think is ours, you know, like uh, 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 actors like Will Smith, comedians like Chris Rock, hip hop artists, R&B artists, pop artists, those people are not about the values of African liberation. Those people are pushing the values of capitalist imperialism, period, period. That's why you could not get me to care about the slap because both of those men, Chris Rock and Will Smith are literally PR agents for our enemy. Like they're literally just pushing the values of this system 24 seven, 365 and every single piece of media they produce. So we have all of these cultural workers, these artists, so-called artists, singers, whatever, who uh, look like us, who are presented as like somehow representing us, but who are actually pushing the values of the enemy. And then outside of mainstream pop culture, we have people producing art among the masses of us, but very rarely is that art rooted in Af revolutionary African values. Very often that art is like pushing the same individualist, consumerist, anti-social messaging as the mainstream because that's what we've been indoctrinated into. And so in the talk, she's like, if you are an artist, you have to be an artist for the revolution as an African person. Um, and sometimes you'll hear people say like, why should I have to do that? Why do I have to be an African artist? Why can't I just be an artist? That's what like that, that lady Zoe, Zoe Bonet said. But anyway, what do you think about that? Do you agree? I didn't, I didn't even know that. Um, it's really important. <laughs> I, I know I liked her. Me too. But, <laughs> and that's, oh yeah, like that's the thing that's like hard for me. So like, um, not, I don't know about hard, but I love hip hop and stuff like that. Like that's my, like one of my first loves. I fucking love hip hop. But I also struggle now with like listening to it because to me it's diverged even far from what the fuck it was back when I mean, I grew up listening to, I'm only 26, but I grew up listening to the 90s and Pac and fucking um, Nas and shit like that. And even as much as they, you know, I love Pac, but even as much as Nas and all of them weren't talking about, like, either way, it's gone so far from that now. And so, like, it's, it's you can see clearly, and people talk about the fact that, like, um, how um, Black culture is global. And I'm like, and I, I think they're literally specifically talking about music and the dress and it's funny because that's not our shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like fucking rap. Okay, yeah, we created rap, but what is rap doing now? What does hip hop look like now? And all it is, is perpetuating, like you said, the same fucking individualistic, um, um, hyper fucking accumulative bullshit where fucking it's uh, now cool to have fucking 20 cars, but be fucking, but see um, little boys in Atlanta selling water and give them $20. Come on, bro. Like, I just, you have, it just, 
the disconnect there is crazy. And so, yeah, we need liberation artists and no more and like less really no creatives. We need people fighting and doing art that's gonna liberate us and not towing the line of the imperialist system and their values and shit like that. And so, yeah, I think it's funny how people say that our culture is dominant and it's not the our dress. What the fuck are the people wearing? What are what are the celebrities wearing? They're wearing what shit made by white people. And if it's made by Kanye, who is Kanye owned by? Okay, we understand how this goes. Now we're supposed to fucking love Virgil Abloh and all this shit because he's uh, was a Versace or I don't even know what it was, but either one of those fucking things. And so ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And like in in the, you, I think you said earlier like. What we think of as woke is like as confused as everything else and people are talking in the chat about like nas for example who's like known as like a, a conscious rapper um and <laughs> ricky said he's stuck in the pyramids and he went on a damian marley song and was talking about mugabe as a dictator good lord like that's an indication that he's not like they present this sheen of wokeness oftentimes by focusing on a very particular interpretation of Afrocentricity that's usually focused on Egypt, that's usually focused on monarchy, and then they say they're about African people. Um, but at the same time, they are still pushing the values of the dominant society. And like while you were talking about how like people talk about, you know, culture vultures and how like a uh, 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 black culture like is, is, is being taken from us and whatnot and how it's like not actually our culture. When you were talking about that, I thought about that song that went that in TikToks because there was like a, a European like vibe into it. Um, it's the it's a Kevin Gates song. I forget what the name of it is, but it goes like I'm just thinking with my dick. Oh, okay. And at first, when I heard it, I was like, this is kind of catchy. And then I looked up the lyrics, and he's like literally talking about um, having sex with an African woman, uh, just like impromptu, and then like dogging her later, and talking about how she's ugly, and he's just using it for sex. And I was like, wow. That's a viral song. <laughs> like I used to think that I was like getting conservative in my old age. And that's why I couldn't appreciate those things anymore. But what I actually think is happening is that I have like such a uh, 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 core belief in like the intrinsic dignity of African people, including African women that I cannot listen to that shit anymore. There's so many songs that are just like straight up debasing African people <laughs> that are like viral songs that are like wildly popular. I'm like, are you listening to what these people are saying? They're like denigrating us. It's like African people denigrating African people. And it's like accepted and viral and shit. And like white white people are vibing to it. I'm goddamn. It's wild. It's really wild. Um, so yeah, we need truly revolutionary African cultural work. We need people who are artists, our people who are artists, to be producing art that makes people want to join the revolution. What is the quote about art? should make revolution irresistible. Like that is what we need. That is what we need. And uh, the other thing is that art cannot be the only thing we do. Because the other thing that came up for me um, in this conversation is like uh, the, the news just came out that uh, Black Lives Matter bought this million dollar mansion uh, like with all these rooms and like a pool and like a hot tub and like for parking for 20 cars. Jesus Christ, and that they also got, you know, $90 million last year at the height of the uprising for George Floyd. Um, and uh, the reason why they said they bought the house, at first no one knew about it, then the news broke and they were trying to explain it after the fact. They said they bought the house because they wanted to use it as a safe house, but then they also wanted to use it, um, like, why do you need a safe house, dog? You work with the Democrats, you're good. But they also wanted to use it as uh, like a place to produce like cultural, like media like YouTube videos, TikTok videos, like black liberation media is how, why they were talking about it. And like that has been like the main thrust of the work that Black Lives Matter does. Like they are not building grassroots independent political power among African people. They're not door knocking for the struggle unless they're telling people to vote for Joe Biden. Um, they are producing media and branding. This is what the millions of dollars have gone, grown to. Like it's, there's, they're, primary focus as a as an organization is like this media work but the media they're producing that they're saying is about black liberation is like telling people to vote or if they're talking about something outside the existing system they're just saying like dream what could the future be like you know what i'm saying like they're not 
they're not actually taking like concrete concrete actions to produce change, nor are they producing media that's calling for revolutionary change. They're producing media that pushes like an extremely idealistic understanding of how change happens. And so I feel like it's really important that when we say revolutionary cultural work, that it's grounded in a materialist understanding of what anti-colonialism uh, anti and, and revolution looks like, but that also it's not the only thing that we do. Do you agree or disagree? I 100% agree because it's, man, that shit's like, like what Kwame Ture used to say in his lectures, we have some of the most corrupt bourgeoisie in the whole fucking world because, oh my God, the they got on there and I'm gonna just say, I mean, I think it was Patrice Colors. She got up there talking about um, the fact she put some Instagram posts talking about the fact that um, for yeah, the liber uh, the influencer house like that was gonna make it better, but somehow like they get up there and they talk about like oh well we never said that if you donate money it's going to the families and like I swear I may I swear when I I never really supported Black Lives Matter just in like as like a global movement. I went out to protest and stuff like that, obviously, but because I wasn't about the whole begging people to for my life to matter. But at the same point in time, I know for a fact when I was donating money, I thought it was going to Tamir Rice's mom and to their families to help with shit. And so when I heard them earlier, I think it was last year, they said one, I don't even know if it's Patrice Colors, it was one of them, of the global network people. And they were like, oh, well, we're not a charity and all this shit. Like, well, like, it's not about being a charity, but if you're raising money during, after a person one of our own gets murdered and you're not helping the family. You supposedly aren't helping yourself either, but somehow you guys get to buy houses because that came out last year too, that she bought like three, four expensive houses in California. Okay, all right, well, you're not using the money for yourself either, but you're, and supposedly the money went to buy a fucking influencer house. Come on, bro. We're not like, I hate that we have to do this. And like, it, it makes me, I don't know if they like grew into like them being fucking um, pawns for the Democrats and like fucking reactionaries to me and like literally a roadblock to the liberation movement or if they were literally chosen and implanted and shit like that. Cause like, I just, I don't, I mean, it's not like a necessary matters, but to me, I just want to know like the origin of where they came from because I think that's like pretty insidious shit because they got, like, dude, and they're sitting up there arguing with Tamir Rice's mom on Twitter and fucking um, 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 Mike Brown's family and Trayvon Martin's family. And they're arguing with all these families that they're supposedly weren't raising money for, but use their, and it's so convoluted and ridiculous. I mean, it's pretty clear to me and us, but like the way they convolute things and try to say they weren't doing things and are at the same exact time, it's unfortunate. But that's how you know it didn't come from the grassroots. It didn't come from the people. It came from whoever the fuck they are and wherever the fuck they came from. They didn't come from the ground. They didn't come from us, our people. We didn't choose them. We didn't choose Patrice Colors. I know that. So like, it's just extremely unfortunate. And yeah, we have to, it can't just be about like fucking dreaming and, and oh, um, painting fucking bullshit ass shit on streets where cops are killing us and shit like that. And doing the fucking, uh, what the fuck was she doing? The electric slide for <laughs> in racism. That shit is nonsense. We got to deal with this bullshit. Fucking. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, the, there was that the electric slide video. Electric slide for the revolution. And there was that other horrible video where it was like a lady wearing a American flag shorts or and twerking around various monuments of Washington, D.C. And I was like, uh, that bitch I Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was gonna say that it cost like a hundred thousand dollars. Like that's where the money went. They weren't giving it to the families. They were they were making twerk for the vote videos. But what are you saying? Sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off. You're right though. Like, and that's exactly where the money was going. And to buy DJ equipment, like they said. And come on, bro. The fuck? What the fuck is that about to do for anyone? We could talk. with get a megaphone for five dollars and you're good, bro. Shut up. But mm -hmm. fucking what she what Afyon was saying in the lecture is that low key, it's a reflex. Our leaders are a reflection on us because we're fucking sleep. We allow, I mean, we understand that like they were forced on us, but we're, it's cause we're not doing our own. We're not doing our job that the folks get to like put the fuck, whoever the fuck they want in front of us. And we're like, oh yeah, that's us. That's one of ours. And everything they do, we're supposed to follow them. And if they say, if they fuck up, all they can do is say, oh, well it's the white people fucking um, attacking me. 
Get the fuck out of here, bro. No, no. So yeah, it's an indictment on us. It is an indictment on us that fucking these clowns get to fucking scurry their way up the fucking ladder and use fucking literal death of our own people, of our babies, of our kids, of our children, our friends, family, all that shit. We get to allow them to use that shit to literally let them buy fucking houses and do fucking TikTok videos supporting Joe Biden. It's ridiculous. But yeah, it's an indictment on us. It's like after y'all said. Yeah, it shows the low level of organization that currently exists among African people in the United States right now. Um, it shows the low level of organization that has existed for quite some time. As a matter of fact, like since the, the counter revolution that unfolded from the 70s to the early 90s that picked back up again recently with the, the mass mobilizations. But we, um, it's the, the fortunate thing is that at the same time as like these, these these fake ass leaders like Patrice Cullors and the other Black Lives Matter founders were like elevated. The reason why they became elevated was because there was a mass movement that existed independently of this organization and of these people. They branded something that had arisen from the masses of working class African people. Like um, the people in Ferguson were the first ones to call it out as a matter of fact. And they got like tarred and feathered across the internet because these were the people that had the platform. But people in Ferguson talked about how these misleaders swooped in and co-opted the energy of a movement that had a working class base and that was incredibly militant. I've talked about it before, but a really good movie that shows this clearly is the documentary Do Not Resist, which is uh, about the, the militarization of police forces in the United States through the 1033 program that gives them surplus military equipment. But a lot of the footage in that documentary is from Ferguson. And you can see it both in the actions that these working class African people were taking in their level of self-organization and also in what they were saying. These people who were elevated as the leaders, and it's not just Patrice Cullors, it's not just Alicia Garza and Opal, it's also people like uh, Sean King, uh, like DeRay, um, so many people that, emer to be honest with you, Cori Bush, so many people that emerged uh, and were elevated by our enemy, they co-opted something that they had nothing to do with, that was actually rooted in the energy and resistance and the anger of the African working class. And the way, the reason why they were able to do what they did is because that energy was, uh, it was focused on mobilization, but the level of organization wasn't high enough to overcome um, the entire structure of capitalism working to co-opt it. That's the same thing that happened during the George Floyd uprising. Uh, was it 2020? It's been two years? Was it last summer? 2020. Yes, I think it was 2020. Yeah. This time is blending together because of the pandemic. But that same, the same thing happened. Like pe we were burning down police stations. People were talking about we need to abolish the police. We need to fund the police. And what did these misleaders and their organizations do? They took that energy that was militant but disorganized, and they organized it around the objectives of the ruling class. They said, "You want to abolish the police? Okay, vote for Joe Biden." And that's people that because they framed Trump as an extension for that. So we have to understand that these people are in the position they are in part because of a mass mobilization that had nothing to do with them. And that shows you that our people are aware that something is seriously off. Our people are aware that something needs to change. They become angry enough to take to the streets, but because we are still disorganized, we lose control of those mobilizations very, very, very quickly. And what we need to do is learn from the example of African people elsewhere in places like Haiti, where they have organized uh, general strikes and mass organized resistance in response to uh, US imperialist intervention. Um, places like Mali, where long-term resistance pushed out the French military. Uh, we have to learn from the Amazon labor union. Like, man, I read an interview with Christian Smalls where he was talking about how they never had any money, how they raised the amount of money they needed to keep going for each week and spent it all. They never had grants. They never had $90 million in funding thrown at them by guilty Europeans. They just went week to week fundraising from the workers and the community they were working in just enough to keep going every single week. And they threw that 
level of organization where they focused on relationship building, where they focused on conscientizing people and helping them understand that if they move collectively, they could take down Amazon. Through that old fashioned person to person organizing, they were able to build a force, an organization that took on Amazon and won. Just like last year, a few months ago, people were saying it could not be done because Amazon is one of the most powerful and wealthy corporations on the planet. And this group of working class people, majority African, led by a working class African man who was not respectable, who didn't care about being respectful or fitting in with their frame of what he should do, were able to beat Amazon. Black Lives Matter got $90 million in a year and we got twerk the vote videos. They had no money and they beat Amazon. So it's just, it shows you that like we don't need uh, uh, to, to try to fit our way within our system. We don't need the leaders imposed upon us. We don't need their money. For some reason, people have it in their head that they have to fundraise before they organize. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like you actually don't. You have to win people to your vision, win people to your idea and the strategy you're pushing. And then the resources will come. So many people will be like, we need to write this grant and then we can do this project backwards. It's backwards. Build it, like talk about what you want to build and start building those relationships, building in the community where you want to build it and people will come. We did that shit last summer with the garden. We spent $50 out of pocket and all of the rest of it came from community members who were organized to carry out that vision. And it still exists and we're reopening it again soon, but it shows you we don't actually need the resources first. And oftentimes that is how people get messed up and co-opted because they go for these fucking white pockets. Uh, so yeah, I forgot the point of what I was saying, but do you have any thoughts? <laughs> no, I think that was, I can't, but I'm pretty sure you were, yeah. But yeah, um, that's it's super true. Cause like, um, and it's funny cause she was, I, I think it was her, uh, Patrice Collins was talking about, oh, it's not, it's hard. Or no, it was someone on Twitter was like, oh, it's hard to come in like dealing with money, like large sums of money and stuff like that. And it's like, well, yeah, but we didn't need that shit. Why are you taking money from fucking Walmart and all these fucking pieces, like uh, taking bullshit, maybe from Amazon. I don't know who the fuck was giving them $90 million, all these fucking collective white companies and shit that are exploiting us to this day. So it's like, we didn't need that shit. You can't sustain mobilization. You can't, you can't sustain that. But what you can sustain, like you said, like the Amazon labor union, you can sustain organization with the amount of resources that you have and that you're able to collect from being an organized force. And so that's something we have to understand that uh, mobilization, while it might be mass and while we, that's important, a mass character is important, 100%. But mass character to mobilize against, a, uh, against an issue is not sustainable. You can't protests for George Floyd for four or five months. We saw that shit. Like people were, you get tired, you get fucking uh, pushed back, you get fucking people in jail and you can't free, you can't take them out. You get people caught with certain things. And since they're not organized, since we're not organized, you're not able to get them out of jail. You're not able to, to, to feed people, to keep people uh, safe and shit like that because we're not organized. And so that's something that's extremely important. And like you said, we have to look for the times where we did it and where we're continuing to do it to this day. Like you said, fucking Amazon, beat, I mean, we Amazon Labor Union beat one of the biggest companies in the whole world. And it was only done through, through organizing and learning and reading together and building camaraderie amongst them, amongst the people that work there to be able to fight against the big ass enemy. And so that's what we need. And we need to realize that victories are happening and recognize when our wins are and not try and fucking, I don't know what people, I don't know. I just like, you know, I know a lot of people are happy, but I just be seeing things like, oh, well, like, you know, it's not enough. And obviously we know it's not enough, but can we take a win, please? Can we take the, they won. Let's celebrate it for a second and then we can keep working and build, you know, but like, let's not minimize it. Let's not like, I don't like the minimize, the minimization of it big fucking thing for them especially for them people that work there and for the the labor movement in general and so yeah absolutely and he and the, the remarkable thing about the amazon labor union is that they didn't work with the existing like uh, ajama calls them like business unions because they're not interested or they don't their their primary work is not building the political consciousness of the union members their primary work is like the bureaucracy of the union, like, you know, places like SEIU, et cetera. And the Amazon labor union did not work 
with those unions. The Amazon labor unions like, we can actually do this ourselves. Like y'all haven't been doing jack shit. So let's see what we can do. And they did it. And now only now, only now when it exists, are they building connections with those formations on their own terms? And it's just like, I'm like, we should study how that was done because that came organically from working class people, from working class African people, working class African men, a population that we are told should be discarded, that is useless. They did that without all of this institutional knowledge that we that we are told is required. So that should absolutely be studied, like how they did that. Um, and then the other thing is like, yeah, like people, um, the, the Amazon labor union was like barely a blip in the headlines outside of like the the so-called progressive press, like it was, it was like wall-to-wall -wall coverage of that goddamn slap for like two weeks. Jesus Christ! But and and then when Kentaji Brown Jackson was going through her hearings and they were just showing their asses, like I was like, you you were at the top of all like these these European capitalist educational institutions, top of your class, a peak of your field, and you still got to take questions from Ted Cruz. Um, I mean, come on. It's just it's like, was it worth it, sis? But anyway, so uh, that was like mainstream news. <laughs> like that was like everywhere. And people were like, isn't this terrible? Look what they're putting her through, so on and so forth. Meanwhile, working class African people side by side with working class European and colonized people from the ground up built this organization that defeated this like massive like the amazon threw millions of dollars at the at the anti-union campaign and it didn't work and like that's not headline news not on the the media platforms that we are supposed to control not on the mainstream media platforms instead what we get is like these purely like this 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 symbolic fake victory this woman who wasn't even chosen by us, who was chosen by Joe Biden, who was solely put in that position so that he could say that he did something for African people while ignoring all other demands made of him by African people. Like they, that was like a fake ass victory they constructed to get us to shut up, to pacify us. Like that's what that was. That's the only reason it was her. That is not a win for us, but that is what is being sold as a win for us, while the actual wins do not get coverage, do not get any kind of shine or attention. It's so insidious. It's really terrible. But yeah. Yeah, it's super unfortunate because like, but that's the way they that's the way they get us because they like get us to believe that our shit is their shit. And like when they win, we win. And Kwame Ture has this funny ass fucking uh, analogy where he's like fucking any slave who believed that he uh, had the same interest as the master would have picked cotton that night. And so just imagine how fucking stupid that would like how ridiculous that is. But that's how some of us act to this day. We're like their victory is our victory and shit like that. Like fucking uh, you watch Black Hawk down and you're chewing, you're fucking cheering for the Black Hawk down for the Black Hawk um, helicopter. You're not cheering for the Somalians and shit like that. And so um you're cheering for Katanji Brown Jackson, but like you see, you get nothing about the Amazon labor union, or if you do your nitpicking or your fucking like, oh well, fucking, what is that actually gonna? So it's just it's it's ridiculous how we we don't recognize our own wins and who's for us and who's not for us, and um, what people are serving and what they're not serving and shit like that. And Erica put in the chat that like people are already getting on the Amazon labor union. I saw. Chris Moss tweet today that he just got, or maybe it was yesterday, that he got off the phone with Bernie and shit like that. And so she said that she's already seeing people give them shit, the, Ab the Amazon labor union for talking to Bernie, as if they don't have collective power there to, to be able to dictate the terms or whatever the fuck Bernie wants to talk about, whatever the fuck they're going to talk about, they have power to, de to decide what the fuck, how things are going to go. And it's not going to be Bernie coming in. Well, I, I would hope not, but I would, I'd assume since they got the power, they were able to to enter these spaces, understanding what they're fucking, what they want and what they're going to, and what they would accept and won't accept and shit like that. And so, like you said, they're, they're talking, they they're probably talking to like other unions now, the big unions that they didn't want to join now because they have collective power. And Kwame Ture also said that he was like, well, fucking what Africans need to understand is that we got into unions without being organized ourselves first. So, you know, like, um, the Amazon labor union, that's important because, you know, it was African people organizing amongst themselves. 
you know, with obviously some other workers, but it was it was them. And they didn't they weren't seeking to uh, go into some big space where they had no power. They were organizing power amongst themselves. And so that's what we need. And then we can enter into coalitions and all this other type of shit with different groups of people and all this other types of shit. But we have to be organized ourselves first and learn from that fucking Amazon labor union that when that's when you can go start talking to people and you can fucking field conversations from Bernie and you can say, fuck AOC, you didn't do shit for us. We don't even want to talk to you, bro. Kick it. And so, yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> and about uh, Black House Hack Down, like I recently learned that that was a win, that Somalia like beat the US to the ground and pushed them out. Like I recently learned that, I've seen that movie and that is not how it is framed. Um, but yeah, like the, 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 like we have wins uh, for the African liberation struggle for the masses of African people happening all the time, all the time. And like the actual wins, they work hard to hide them from us. They work hard. Like there's a reason why you don't be seeing Haiti on the news because Haiti never sits down. Haiti is like, we, this is bullshit and we are gonna fight back constantly, constantly. And the US will never put that on the news. They'll put tragedy porn about Haiti on the news. They'll put like a uh, uh, messaging that p- pushes like the Haiti is cursed message on the news. And like they'll put the white man's burden message on the news, but they will never put Haitian resistance to US imperialism on the news because they don't want us to see that and catch ideas. They don't want us to see that and question what it is that's actually happening in Haiti. Um, so we have to uh, yeah, just recognize like what is ours and what is not. A person uh, selected by them to serve in an institution created by them is not a victory for us. Uh, 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 a Zionist African actor slapping another Zionist African actor is not a victory for the defense of African women. Uh, the An Oscar being given to an African uh, representation uh, for African people, like none of these things that victories defined by the enemy are actually victories for us. We have to do the work to develop that like, African-centered mindset that she's talking about that puts the continent and the masses of our people first and seek out the victories that serve those objectives. We have to do the work to find them on our own because they are not going to show that to us. So yeah, um, but we're getting to to about the closing time for this session of a Pan African film series. So I want to know if you had any like final thoughts. Huh. Um, I think the final thoughts would be what she talked about, just the the African unity amongst the people, and to stop. Bro, we understand that LeBron James and Drake is cool. We get it. And like, we understand that all them rich motherfuckers all are in cahoots with each other. We know that they're cool. We get it. We see that. Um, but at the, but we need fucking, um, we need us that's on the ground, the poor folks the, that represent all of us, most of the majority of us to be cool. And we need to, like she said, focus on people that's on the other side of the Atlantic or uh, below the Gulf of Mexico. Cause I don't know what like, ocean or sea is down there. Either way, below the Gulf of Mexico. We <laughs> need to focus on the Caribbean. Um, we need to look elsewhere besides our own little uh, fucking pocket or corner of the world. And we need to look to Africa first. And the, well, we need to look to Africa and we need to look to the diaspora in general. And so um, that shit is super important and we need to stop like letting the enemy divide us uh, and benefit from that. Because in it only benefits them when we don't realize that we're the same exact people and we just live in different places because of them. And so focus on that. And um, yeah, I just really want, you know, African community, African unity amongst the people. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get some, we'll get some, some good results from that. So, yeah. I agree. 100% 100% agree. Uh, so yeah, this has been the April edition of the Pan-African Film Series. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for your comments. It's been a great conversation. It was a really great video. I feel like pumped for the rest of the day. Uh, so we do these on the second Saturday of every single month at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, which means we're gonna be back on the second Saturday in May with another film related to African Liberation Day because the month of May is for African Liberation Day. So please join us. Second Saturday in May, 2 p.m. Mountain Time, the same platform where you're watching this stream. You can watch the May edition of the Pan-African Film Series. Also, our bi-weekly news program, Weekly Pan-African News, is back 
next week on Thursday, April 14th at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Myself and Monica are going to be having a discussion about the history of African and Irish solidarity. It actually goes back hundreds of years. It is actually like a really tight bond. Like the Irish people in Ireland are still colonized and have shown revolutionary internationalism and solidarity with the African liberation struggle for a long, long, long time. So we're going to talk about what that looks like. We're also going to talk about why the Irish people in the United Snakes are a different situation. <laughs> so, so please join us this Thursday, 1 p.m. Mountain Time for the next edition of Weekly Pan-African News. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to help us out, hit like and share wherever you're watching the stream and help us get us more eyes on this. But otherwise, have a great rest of your day and stay ready for revolution. Thank you.